Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm Dr. Thami Yakub, the uh, CEO and President of Rock Science and General Chair of uh, RIC 2023. I welcome you all for this special, special awards session. We instituted the Rock Science Lifetime Award Achievement Award in, in the year 2021 to recognize individuals whose contributions to the geotechnical engineering profession are actively in engineering research and practice. The impact of this contribution may but not necessarily include implementation in geotechnical software. The Rock Science Lifetime Achievement Award is pre presented to members of the geotechnical engineering fraternity who are judged to have advanced the geotechnical engineering profession. They must have exhibited technical competence at the highest levels and profoundly contributed to geotechnical engineering practice, research, education, including mentoring and public service over a long period. Lastly, the recipients must have pursued practical solution or approaches to complex geotechnical engineering problems and received road recognition in the field. Dr. Everett Hook received the first award in the year 2021. It is my pleasure tonight to invite Dr. Everett Hook to introduce this year awards winner. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Everett Hook. My role is to introduce the recipient of this year's uh, Achievement Award. And uh, so I'm going to introduce you to Professor Nori Morgenstern, or Norbert Morgenstern, more correctly. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce him uh, for this award. Uh, we've known each other for many years, and, and uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to, to introduce him. He was born in Toronto, and in, 1960, in 1956, he received a Bachelor of Applied Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Toronto. In 1964, he received a diploma uh, of the Imperial College of Science and Technology in London, together with a PhD from the University of London. And in 1968, he returned to Canada uh, to join the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Alberta. He retired from the University of Alberta in 2020. Prior to, uh, or from 1968 onwards, Dr. Morganson and his colleagues at the University of Alberta uh, worked on the development of uh, uh, soil mechanics and its expansion into uh, topics of uh, uh, permafrost engineering and the mining of the Alberta oil sands. And so the department uh, developed, uh, the, or the, yeah, the Department of uh, Civil Engineering, the soil mechanics group in there, developed to what, in my opinion, was the is one of the best departments in the world. Dr. Morganston uh, has received many awards. Uh, I had a whole page full, which I decided to leave out and just mention a couple of them. Uh, he has received honorary degrees from the University of Toronto and Queen's University. Uh, he uh, uh, has become a member of the Order of Canada in 2001. And there are uh, other, uh, as I say, a whole page of, of qualification, of, uh, achievements that uh, I have listed, but I'm not going to repeat here. Dr. Morganson has also made outstanding contributions in his role as a geotechnical consulting engineer, and I'm sure he's going to talk about some of those this evening. So uh, it is with great pleasure that I uh, invite Nordy Morganston to come and talk to you.
Thank you, Everett, for your generous words. It's a special pleasure to be introduced to you. Uh, after all, you're older than I am, and therefore I <laughs> respect the seniority. And of course, we, as you indicate, have known each other for a long time. In fact, I guess it's because of Everett's distinction in rock mechanics and his contributions to things that came out of the University of Toronto and contributions to this organization that I think is the seed that brings us all together. So it's a special treasure, pleasure to share the occasion with Everett and the, the likely Everett Hook family. <laughs> but also, it uh, is a, a, a somewhat ironic and, uh, and amusing pleasure to have, it, have this celebration in Toronto, uh, where I was born and went to the University of Toronto, as Everett indicated. Not only born in Toronto, but born within walking distance of where we are in Spadina Avenue, went to Harvard Collegiate, went to, uh, uh, went to Huron Street Public School, all centered around the University of Toronto. So as uh, we share this kind of not quite end of career celebration, it's sort of an interesting full circle. When I left uh, University of Toronto in, in, uh, in 1956 to go to graduate studies in London, um, and, and, and I then joined the uh, staff of Imperial College actually in 1960 after receiving the honorary degrees that, that uh, Everett indicated. The formalities came a few years later, as he indicated. It was an exciting time, uh, and uh, uh, the concepts of effective stress were coming into practice. The Bishop Slip Circle analysis had just been published a year or two before. Co digital computing was just coming. In fact, we used to do cr programming in machine language, if you know what that is, and things like that. So it was a special time to be there and to join such a distinguished group. Uh, where I was for uh, on the staff from 60 to 68, when, as Everett indicated, returned to, uh, to Canada at, at that time. I want to uh, uh, share with you uh, the uh, uh, passageway from that time of 19, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 1960 uh, uh, to today, some 63 years. And this passage is punctuated with the theme from certainty to uncertainty, uh, as you can see in the slides. The early stages of one's career as a young academic is to concentrate on teaching, to develop a research program, and both of those imply a certain certainty and appreciating of standards and so forth. But the, role, the discovery of uncertainty that, that was a kind of a, cornerstone of development came really from professional practice and never indicated that that will be reflected in the theme being shared today. The first um, example uh, that really pointed out uh, the, the, uh, the implications of uncertainty in our work was a simple assignment. I was, by this time, I guess it might, might have been the middle 60s, getting enough reputation as a junior capable person to be invited to share some professional practice. And what you see is a cross-section of a simple homogeneous dam well, it's with some, some stiff clay shale on the upstream and some weathered soft clay shale on the bottom being built in a, an abandoned brick pit to store fluid fly ash that would come to the site by, tra by, by, uh, uh, by train. Uh, the, the, uh, the material for the upstream was freshly harvested and easily compacted and formed a stiff embankment. The material in the downstream was a soft weathered clay that was too weak and weathered to be used in brick making and been allowed to soften, but the economics required using that. The design was traditional. Uh, I used a vein test to get the undrained strength, calculated a factor of safety in excess of 1.5, which was the standard of care. In fact, I think it was 1.8, and the structure was built accordingly. Sometime after its completion, the telephone rang, and the owner said, your embankment has failed. And I went out and I said, oh, no, it hasn't failed. It's yielded. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, he was right, because if you took that, that cartoon and had big cracks in the, between the stiff and the unstiff, you'd get water in it, and it wouldn't perform as intended. Fortunately, the economics of flattening and so forth uh, were not sufficiently severe to destroy my career. Uh, but uh, I did learn a lesson, 
that the factor of safety, the standard testing, the standards of design were calibrated to a certain anticipated performance, even though deformations were not embedded in that calculation. And the, and the vein test in this very soft clay perhaps went out to, I don't know, 100% strain or the like before it reached its full strength. And that was a lesson that the standards, notwithstanding uh, having the experience behind them, need interpretation. There was uncertainty embedded in them. I went from that learning through other case histories uh, and uh, the, the always uh, reminded me that the standard tests, the standard procedures, and so forth require reflection uh, before application and began to formulate concepts of of uh, certainty and uncertainty. And uh, this led to a fairly major paper uh, that first of all began with uh, some sources of uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, model uncertainty, that goes by the fancier name of aleatoric and, and uh, epistemic uncertainty. But I recognized early on of human uncertainty that isn't embedded in model uncertainty. And as this, this uh, story unfolds, over the subsequent uh, now 60 odd years, uh, you'll see that the human uncertainty that I later called embedded ignorance plagues us today and constitutes a very special separate understanding. Uh, I pursued this question of uncertainty in performance in a uh, paper delivered in Hong Kong, uh, I think it was probably 1990 or so, for the Lum Lecture, the first Lum Lecture, for Peter Lum, who was a distinguished professor. And it began with trying to understand how good we were at prediction in our business. And it was fashionable at that time to do prediction, um, prediction exercises. If you had an embankment, you might do a trial embankment, do a lot of studies, invite people to predict when it would fail and you'd take it to failure. Or you'd do the same thing with a pile foundation, uh, do large tests, ask people to predict from the database, take them to failure, and so on. So I, took, I decided to analyze these published uh, uh, prediction exercises and come to an answer, are we good at prediction? I established a scale here, which you can read uh, arbitrarily to some degree, but I think fair that something was plus or minus 5% uh, was excellent, down to plus or minus 50% for prediction would be bad and ranking in below. And I'm not, of course, going to go through all the cases I analyzed, but this is an example of a case for an embankment on soft clay. It was in Malaysia. They were beginning to build a lot of uh, highway work on soft clays, and they, uh, they built a fairly large test embankment with all kinds of wonderful test data of vein tests and undisturbed sampling and cone tests and invited, invited people to participate in competition. Uh, 31 predictors took, uh, took uh, uh, part in this, and you can see the ranking was uh, uh, perhaps only one was excellent and most were poor as an indication of our capacity to predict. And all of the other cases delivered the same message from settlement of sands to pile capacity and so on, which is an important enforcement of the learnings in this path that I was on, that our world is plagued with a lot of uncertainty in many, many of its dimensions, and we have to be conscious of that. The paper itself went into some reflection of, uh, of, uh, of managing risk, as we'll come to uh, the end of the conclusion from that paper. But I came across a wonderful um, uh, uh, environmental uh, 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 scientist, uh, Southwood, and this uh, was impressed with the way he managed uncertainty. And while he didn't refer to geotechnical engineering, I copied one of his guidances in the face of intrinsic uncertainty associated with geotechnical engineering. It's wise to remember his caution that the things we'd like to know may be unknowable. And that became uh, an embedded, if you will, uh, concern as I began to progress through a variety of undertakings. At the end of this LUM lecture, uh, published the references there for those who might want it published in the year 2000. I concluded after these cases and how, what we might do to manage them, manage the uncertainty, I concluded that the assurance of geotechnical performance would be enhanced if geotechnical engineering shifted from the promise of uncertainty to the analysis of uncertainty. And that's the recurrent theme that I'm trying to present to you of where, we've, where, where we have been 
where we're going and where we are in this challenging uh, activity that we all share. I was very delighted uh, as I read uh, uh, more things in preparation for this presentation to come across uh, an excellent uh, uh, statement by John Curran and, and Reginald Helen, uh, which uh, I think had the title, uh, Uncertainty is King, Make Room for It. So I felt an immediate resonance with the community that I was going to be with this evening. And we'll quote here, if room is therefore not made in geomechanics software analysis to accommodate uncertainty, any conclusions will be open to question. And I would share that, though their, their, their uh, uh, concerns focused ultimately in response to that uh, on uh, the issues associated with uh, 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 probabilistic matters, and, and you'll see that I'm less, uh, less uh, compliant in sharing some of that pers uh, uh, pursuit in a moment. Uh, this, this wonderful uh, statements were enhanced by another paper that I uh, uh, reviewed in order to uh, prepare for this, this summary presentation. It was a wonderful um, uh, overview paper by Professor Foon in, in Singapore with a number of very knowledgeable co-authors who produced a state-of-the-art supported by the Technical Committee of the International Society of Soil Mechanics on Numerical Methods in Geomechanics. So it has a lot of, if you like, professional weight behind the in important information uh, that, they, uh, that they assembled in, in, in what's been going on to manage uncertainty over the couple of decades of literature that they reviewed. They concluded, Geotechnical software can provide better decision support by computing the probability of failure, reliability, uh, that shouldn't be in clay, reliability index as opposed to in clay, as one basic output in addition to stresses, strains, forces, and displacements. And they finally concluded the purpose of numerical modeling is to enhance decision making and practice rather than enhance our prediction ability. You'll find as I move on from these two, uh, if you like, uh, summary statements of the view at that time, that I'm fairly lukewarm about the decisions support by computing probability of failure and reliability, and I'll indicate my experience in that regard. And I actually don't agree with the purpose of numerical modeling is to enhance decision making in practice rather than enhance our prediction ability. I will end up with a more optimistic situation of the work in numerical modeling, which is a common interest shared today, and indicate that we actually have a bolder, more exciting uh, message and capacity to deliver than just be a, 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 a hand servant in enhancing uh, uh, prediction capacity. So let's move along uh, and see some of the learnings from different a few selected projects and indicate how I got to where I am today. This is a photograph of the tailings dam on the Syncrude Oil Sands project, and it's time, perhaps even today, uh, one of the largest earth structures in the world. Uh, it's some 18 kilometers in length. It has heights of impoundments up to 90 to 100 meters high, and uh, it covers an area 22 kilometers square and uh, you can imagine that having been involved with that structure for some decades, one learned a lot and hopefully contributed a lot. It wasn't practical to investigate the complicated uh, geological conditions underlying that structure, let's say on a 100 meter by 100 meter spacing over that kind of length. So it was partitioned in terms of zones, uh, geologically affected zones, and then proceeded observationally to find zones that weren't behaving as intended and to undertake remedial actions as required. The major aspects that controlled stability had to do with geology that looked like this, in which one has till overlying a Cretaceous, highly plastic clay shale called the Clearwater Formation, and there has been glacial drag in its history, sometimes incorporating sheared, highly plastic clay within the till, the till otherwise is, is fairly good material, or doing glacial drag creating the slip surfaces that you see at the interface between the till. So the interaction between, if you like, uh, this, this uh, element of glacial tectonics, uh, uh, to give it a name, 
and this weak substrate that, sit, that sat over the oil sands, controlled in the worst cases the, the stability of the structure and had to be managed through its life, which is now more, more or less over. This, you can, looking at this cross section, you can see it started fairly steep and ended up flattening at various stages as one learned more and more. And you can see the kind of increments of deformation in the zones that became well monitored uh, that, uh, that were measured seasonally. And, and, and one always was concerned about whether they would take off on you or not. But there was certainly an intensive monitoring, understanding the movement me mechanisms that were taking place. Uh, as we approached, hopefully, the requirement to determine its ultimate capacity, uh, it became a subject of some research, but also was a case history that I invoked in some research that we did about 20 to 25 years ago when we tried to answer, what is the probability of failure of a safe dam? You could say, oh, it's safe, it's not going to fail, but that isn't what probability gives you. So we undertook six or seven case histories of detailed a probabilistic analysis of failure, uh, made some contribution to the mechanics of how to do that, which I won't go into. Uh, some of these were case histories, some of these, these uh, failure examples of test case histories in which one knew the factor of safety was unity. You could then take the database from that and make a safe case if they failed at a, at a height of 10 meters. You could say, here, I'm going to build it with the same database to 8 meters, and it would have a calibrated factor of safety. But you'd have the variability of all the input data, and you could then calculate the probability of failure. Or we had this case, the Syncrude dam, uh, in which uh, we ultimately knew what was the controlling mechanism, this, this sheared uh, clear water formation. We could determine its strength from some back analysis, but we also had the original database that might have calculated, might have reflected the challenge of design at an early stage as another way of calculating the a probability of failure of a safe structure. So here was a safe structure at a factor of safety 1.3 with known pore pressures. Uh, and, but it was based on an original, cal uh, an original database of shear strength uh, from very capable uh, site investigation companies who knew what they were doing. And here's the kind of spread of shear strength that one had if you assembled all that data at the outset. Uh, also, one had um, structure was, was well, uh, was well uh, instrumented. We had lots of pore pressure. And as you went across these zones of concern, this isn't the whole dam. These are the zones of concern. You could see, depending upon where you were, reflecting most recent construction versus some degree of dissipation, uh, some variability of pore pressure. So you had two big drivers. You had variability of shear strength. You had variability of pore pressures, all determined. And you could now calculate a probability of failure uh, using a Monte Carlo process and a fairly, fairly uh, state of the practice for doing this kind of work, even in the way we handled uncertainty. And it's all published in a thesis in a number of papers. The summary of these case histories uh, is in this table, which we, we, this figure, which unfortunately we never got around to properly publishing. Uh, if you say, I'm going to design probabilistically, then you say, what is my criterion for doing that? If I'm going to be designing a more classical standard of uh, factor of safety, we have criteria 1.3, 1.5 or so, depending upon the configuration. Uh, if we're designed probabilistically, some would say, well, you want to design based on an allowable reliability index, or you want to design based on allowable calculated probability of failure. Here is an example of our case histories, the white dots showing that there is uh, a reliability index calculated with very detailed probabilistic analyses for a variety of cases, residual soils, the synchronous site, some uh, clay foundations that, that Maurer test embankment in Malaysia. And you see, firstly, there is no significant relationship between reliability index and factor of safety. Secondly, if you ask your probabilistic people from the, let's say, mechanics world, what should the, a design factor's reliability index be, they tell you around three and a half to four. And you can see that our world is commonly in the world of two, which tells you as a geotechnical engineer that you take more risk than other people, and that isn't news to you. We certainly work in a riskier world. 
So we actually dropped Pursuit, pursuit after that, a very, I think, important learning for those of us who did the research, that we didn't see that there was a practical end product of a design criteria based on tolerable probability or tolerable uh, reliability index as a measure, an equivalent measure of that for the wide class of materials that we deal with. Some might quarrel with that in the offshore world, but that was certainly our finding from studies based primarily on slopes and dams. The one that has a high reliability index was a uh, natural slope in, uh, in, in, uh, in Sweden that had very uniform soft clay, so the best, if you like, the best cases with very little dispersion in the database, the best cases we would ever encounter might meet that standard reliability index at three and a half to four. The rest of our world is much more risk riskier than that. So we continued here at Syncrude, we continued uh, uh, not, not to pursue probabilistic measures. Certainly we did sensitivity analyses and all of that, but that's not me creating a metric for an allowable probability of failure. And we're now anxious to know how are we going to get to this structure for completion. We were instrumenting a lot to get the deformations and we're in the world of about the mid 90s uh, 18 and 1990s, uh, and our ability to do uh, finite element work was improving, uh, certainly, and it was a major activity of research to take these tools and apply them to important case histories. And you can see that uh, the uh, failure of this structure was not so much controlled by this weak layer that we focused on before, but the resistance at the end when it would break out. And this is comparison between finite element calculations uh, in those days and, and, uh, and observation of deformations. Uh, and we're certainly this, uh, as, at a kind of quasi-research level able to replicate this more and more. It wasn't the kind of pro production research. It was at the production uh, calculations that you're all doing these days. So it was at, still at the research level. But it led us to the view that for the class of potential failure modes exhibited by the synchro tailings dike, uh, it is both possible and effective to construct a numerical modeling using a history matching approach, not so much prediction, a history matching approach. And this provides insight for the evaluation of both past and future performance. So we're well on our way uh, to the integration of the uh, computational tools as they matured, both in complexity, because this was still a fairly, fairly simple constitutive formulation, but more importantly in productivity, because these would take months for us to do in a university bedding as opposed to give me an answer next Monday, which many of you are used to. Uh, this carried on uh, with other examples that I wrote uh, at, the, at, this, at a late state-of-the-art paper given to an ASC meeting some uh, 30 years ago or so. One can imagine a time when simulation is so firmly embedded within the observational method that it becomes recognized as an essential tool in assisting the practicing engineer to evaluate correctly all of the information available to him. This places a greater burden on the engineer to recognize and understanding in an ongoing manner the limitations of advanced analysis. And that's a common element, I think, that we all bring uh, together to this meeting and others like it. All of this was reinforced, building on the synchronous experience and other case histories as we now enter into uh, some, some uh, I guess, 25 years ago uh, um, or, or little less, the case history of the Alameda Dam uh, that was an important learning curve for the advancement and the integration of, of, uh, of computational analyses into practice. The Alameda Dam, it's the red dot on that figure, is a uh, water, is a flood protection dam in, in uh, southern Saskatchewan. It's not a very complicated dam, uh, but it had a complicated history. Uh, it, the, what it rose after it was constructed in the year of 2011, there was a major flood uh, in Saskatchewan uh, going down into North Dakota, and the reservoir surcharge is some five to six meters above the full supply level. So you've designed a dam for a maximum elevation we're here, and you've got to manage this, this flood, and this, it's overwhelming your spillway, and it's risen higher than that. And during that condition, it moved. And uh, uh, there were certain uh, significant movements. 
uh, consultants were brought in to assess what happened under those movements. They calculated a factor of safety of unity, which indicated that it was close to failure, and, uh, and recommended lower the reservoir, carry out site investigations, conduct detailed assessments, and so on, all with a certain in, in, uh, urgency because of that movement, because of that failure. I was having been involved in some of the problems of the dam early on in its, its design history, was brought in to review uh, some of this work. Uh, here you see a picture of the dam. Uh, it's not a very complicated dam. It's a homogeneous, compacted dam with an inclined, uh, inclined drain, a drainage out to the downstream. But you'll see a very substantial berm downstream of the dam with wiggly lines indicating it's very long. Uh, notwithstanding the review board at the time, the uh, designers and their review board neglected to see that this dam was a dam built on till on a plastic clay shale and neglected to, under, to recognize the role of the glacial drag and the strength that that interface was residual strength as opposed to the strength that, that they had uh, calculated. And it moved during construction and we had ultimately uh, shut the dam down and build that stabilizing burn, that burn. So there's a lot of instruments going back to that history of movements, history of, of, uh, of retreat while it was being evaluated, and ultimately stabilizing the dam. And now a new episode of, of an, excessive, uh, an excessive flood putting a higher hydraulic surcharge on the dam, creating movements. And uh, the history of the dam is well recorded. Uh, in a paper by Mittal and, and Raman, the references on the slide if somebody wish it or you send me an email. And that indicates the large displacements undertaken and uh, encountered in the 90s. Uh, high pore pressures developed, stopped while uh, we reevaluated design and ultimately got it to perform as intended with a large stabilizing burn. And then, of course, the flood that we're talking about uh, more re uh, somewhat years later. This illustrates some of the conditions. High excess pore pressures, these are high pore pressures in the foundation. They responded during construction to total stress changes. You can see very gentle dissipation, very slow. We're quite used to that in some of our clay shale foundations in Western Canada. The, the, uh, the Gardner Dam, which was built, dare I say, almost 80, 60, uh, certainly 60 years ago, shows very little pore pressure for high construction pore pressures developed when it was built. So this is something not too surprising to us. The instrumentation we had was quite unambiguous. Here are the kind of movements the inclinometers were determining at that weak interface. So the geomechanics, if you like, while late to the game, were relatively well understood. The consultants who came in after the flood said, it's on the brink of failure. You better do something about it. But I had encountered this with some work with the Corps of Engineers and other projects and said, well, I'm not sure that the two-dimensional stability analysis we did is a whole story. So we began by doing three-dimensional stability analysis, first of all, and found that the factor of safety uh, uh, that uh, uh, is now, in fact, was much higher than one, was virtually two, because of the large shearing resistance you get in the tills and so on before it gets on top of the banana skin that's controlling the deformations. So that removed some of the urgency and uh, uh, gave us some comfort. Uh, this figure is hard to see in detail, but the, the owner then wanted to know, well, how much might it move and do we have a problem in the long term? Because we continue to study the deformations of the Gardner Dam, which has a, a history of small movements for some time. So we undertook a three-dimensional uh, deformation analysis, and uh, we had these uh, vectors of the movements. And the vector fit, uh, the inclinations don't match perfectly, but the magnitudes are a pretty good match. I like to use the the, the phrase of, of uh, model equivalence. This is not the highest model equivalence you'd like. If you had another four or five months, you might have put in a little anisotropy and the stiffness to get the model equivalence to be better. But it certainly displays the key elements of the kind of movements, history matched to what has occurred, and now you can interrogate the model to indicate what's happening in the future. So we've now got to match the model response to the inclinometer data. And we can use it to generate failure scenarios for comparison with the monitoring results. 
Well, I know having read a fair amount of literature on numerical analysis and conducted it, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of uh, a pleasure when you calculate a, st a strength reduction factor that's the same as the factor of safety and say, well, these are both in, uh, honoring the mechanics in the same way. And that, by and large, is the case for a simple, simple case. So we did the conventional strength reduction in which the strength of all materials is reduced progressively uh, and, and, uh, and found a factor of safety. In that way, we're quite consistent with conventional limit equilibrium, and I think there's a fair amount of literature. But we now saw, if you like, the innards of the failure mechanism, and we said, look, this is mobilizing its full strength along these pre-sheared materials. And it's really held in place by the breakout resistance of the stiffer till above it. And so let us do a strength reduction just on the till alone, which reflects the details of the failure mechanism. And when we did that, we got a very different answer. If you're able to look at the deformations, you can see that the traditional factor safety strength reduction, which is really a stress, which is really a stress path, you're obliged to reduce the strength parameters equally everywhere. And so you get the kind of large deformations that you see on the left, which would give you a comfort. But if you said, I'm fixing that strength at the residual strength, which is about seven and a half degrees, and I'm now going to do strength reduction on the breakout zone alone, you'll get a much lower tolerable deformation as you're mobilizing the full strength of the till and give you a much more critical failure mode. I haven't yet come up with a a good term for this, this process of looking at partial mechanisms or something like that, which, of course, the, uh, a, a well-formulated and, and good model equivalence allows you to interrogate in something that you should bear in mind in your own practice. So this was leading us on, and in a summary uh, uh, paper uh, in, in, uh, that I gave in Hong Kong on evaluation, the history evaluation of slope stability, I b began to advocate more aggressively the movement from precautionary-based design, which is a factor of safety, the observational method, uh, having an alternate in place in case, the, uh, in case it doesn't behave as intended on the pre precautionary based design. So that's the normal standards, as opposed to a performance-based design in which you have all the reserve resistances to interrogate. Of course, you have monitoring, you have the observational method still, but you're now integrating with real-time response modeling. So this was, I think, the first time that I formally advocated that and had a occasion to advocate it more strongly. Uh, that occasion arose a few years ago in, uh, I guess, uh, nine, what is it, 2018 or something, in Brazil, when I was asked to give the sixth Victor de Mello lecture on the subject of geotechnical risk regulation and public policy. And uh, in so doing, I summarized some of the work that Victor and I and others had initiated in managing the landslide hazards that they'd had in Hong Kong. And you can see uh, the history of landslide fatalities with the red bars on the left after we established, after they took up the Geotechnica, created a geotechnical control office that we advocated and provided some guidance to how the, um, how the fatality records plunged dramatically and they have been basically zero for a number of years as the process has played itself out. So this became the recognition of a safety culture and if you follow the safety culture, you can do things to provide the safety for which we are so obliged to do in much of our work. But I want to emphasize, without spending time on how that was achieved, that this isn't done by a calculation alone. Safety fulfilling the requirements of the safety culture requires a system or a systematic attack. And these have been a number of issues beyond modern calculations and instrumentation and landslide warnings and so forth uh, required to, to, to reach the, the uh, uh, achievements of the safety system in Hong Kong. That should be borne in mind, not because you're practicing, or some of you might be practicing in Hong Kong or elsewhere in China, but the concept of a safety system should also uh, be a foundation element in all of the things that I'm particularly involved in, in trying to ensure the safety of Taylor's dams, which is the next theme that I'm coming to, which have been fraught with problems and have been killing many people, and the industry lost its social license to practice. So let's talk to uh, that. 
So we have, we have uh, understanding of safety, we have understanding of risk, we have understanding of uncertainty, we have understanding of improving tools to evaluate these things. And you might say, well, where might we encounter such problems that give us such great concern? This is, many of you will recognize, the photograph of the spillway of the Oroville Dam, which has the largest dam in the United States, or perhaps one of the largest, the largest capacity in the United States, owned by the Bureau of Reclamation and owned by the Department of Water Resources, two of the leading dam management agencies, with a, with a kind of uh, parade of distinguished consultants and review boards and, and, and risk analysis and all the like all involved in ensuring the integrity of this, this dam. And they had a uh, flood protection, pro they had a flood problem, a uh, flooding problem uh, in uh, this part of California some years ago, which was intending to utilize the spillway to manage the flood. And when they began to put water down the spillway, it disappeared and they had to evacuate 180,000 people because they couldn't manage the flood in the way that you'd normally like to manage it. Fortunately, <coughs> the, the, the flooding was terminated by retention, but that was intended to be a managed spillway. And I know that uh, there were risk analyses carried out, and I know that there was another person who chaired a risk analysis before this event. <coughs> and they had the integrity of the spillway on the, on the, uh, the risk sheet. And they said, well, that's no problem. It's in rock. It will never damage the dam. So they took it off the risk register. It wasn't on rock. It was on weathered soil that had been cleaned out and built according to specification. Nothing very complicated, but clearly a terrible error. You remember my concern about it embedded ignorance and human error as opposed to the more traditional kinds of uncertainty. So we find even in the world of well-managed water dams, these kinds of things can happen, but they happen more commonly in the less well-managed world in the mining industry that certainly uh, your company here has much involvement as do many of us. Uh, this is <clears throat> a photograph of the Mount Pauly tailings dam. You can see the tailings dam in the upper left uh, corner of this, of this structure and the tailings have flowed out. Fortunately, no deaths, uh, significant environmental implications. Uh, but this is in British Columbia with a well-developed uh, 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 engineering culture, uh, well-known consultants with a government that has criteria and safety hazards and inspections and the like. I'm, we're not discussing artisanal failures in some poorly developed country that isn't under control. We're looking at issues in our, if you like, uh, world that should know better. This is the Samarco failure uh, in Brazil owned by BHP and Vale, uh, that uh, one of the largest uh, uh, iron ore cases, uh, 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 <coughs> mines in the world, and the Taylor's Dam, a huge Taylor's Dam collapsed, killing some 19 or 20 people in the year 2013. And this, as I was writing the Devenna Lecture, is a case in Australia, in New South Wales, the Katia Dam, that also didn't quite collapse, but lost. It was in two segments. It had a north segment and a south segment. The, the intermediate wall failed in this way. Tailings liquefied and flowed. Fortunately, they were captured in the south impoundment. This occurred just as I was putting the, the, the mellow lecture together. So this is the world of, of uh, safety, limited safety, uh, safety standards being accepted, all in a world that should, should know better. Now, the, after, the, after the first two, after Mount Pauli occurred and after Samarco occurred, uh, the International Council of Mining and Metals, which is, isn't a governing body, it's a combination of the major mining companies in the world. It represents, I don't know, perhaps 30% of, 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 of mine productions, the, the, all of the big gold companies there, Copper, Rio Tinto, all the companies that are, that are uh, premium companies and you have to pay them out to form this council. And the council, if you, if you like, is self-governing to do good and to be effective and, of course, to fulfill their uh, license to operate. They became, of course, concerned that here were uh, uh, the kind of mines for members of, of this company that uh, are failing. 
and they brought in well-known consultants, uh, good friends of ours, to do a study of uh, what's gone on, which they did. And they took three cases, the Los Frailes Dam, which had failed in, in Spain about 25 years ago. They took Mount Pauli, and they took the Samarco Dam as case histories to understand what's going wrong. And they concluded that the issues weren't particularly technical. They were primarily governmental in terms of uh, governance, in terms of management, and so on. But, but I, perhaps I'm characterizing their major finding. There wasn't a lot to, new to learn about the uh, geotechnical elements. Now, I'd worked on the forensic investigation of all of the three that they studied, both the Las Frailes case in Spain, uh, Pauli, and Samarco, and ultimately worked on Katie as well. And that didn't ring true with me. I'd found that in all of those cases, that uh, preventing catastrophic failures, uh, understanding the, the mechanics of the failure, actually had elements of, of, of uh, human error at the technical level associated with them, which later on I called embedded ignorance in the summary paper. Uh, in the DeMello lecture, I then went to all of the cases of incidents that I had been involved in or that I knew about, or I knew the file enough that there's a, perhaps a friend of mine or others have, uh, had been involved or there had been a publication. I knew enough about the file to make a comment whether the basic cause, not root cause in a formal analysis, but the basic cause was either engineering, operations, or regulatory. And the preponderance from the uh, classic liquefaction failure uh, in New Mexico of the Tyrone Dam uh, down to the Cadia Dam, which in Brumadino, which is at the bottom, hadn't occurred yet, uh, had predominantly uh, were technical issues. Later on, I, in, I, in, in writing a summary of where do we stand in terms of, of the state of the industry, I actually called it embedded ignorance on our part the kind of embedded ignorance that I illustrated that I had when I offered consulting advice on that little clay dam back in the 1960s and also learned through error and experience with many other cases as the years went by. So we have, it's interesting, there's a case in Italy. This is the famous Stava Dam, uh, which killed close to 300 people when it failed. And I, with the late uh, Elio D'Apolloni, were retained by the owner of the Stava mine uh, before, uh, prior to failure. And uh, Monte, uh, Mont Edison, a very large Italian conglomerate, <coughs> they had closed the dam, closed the mine, and give it back to the local state, who then encouraged a local entrepreneur to open the mine. Had they left the mine closed, it never would have failed. So this is an example of a regular, well-intentioned, they wanted to create some local employment. There was a high unemployment in that part of Italy. But had they just left it closed, this never would have failed. So there are a number of aberrations to the technical issue, but the technical issues of liquefaction, inadequate foundation conditions, so on, were paramount. And it's written and discussed in detail uh, in the in the Domeno lecture. Uh, and, and it's interesting, this is, the, uh, this is the failure of the Los Frailes Dam in Spain, which created Spain's worst environmental disaster. Nobody was hurt here, uh, but it flowed into a wonderful environmental preserve and, and it cost the mining company tens of millions to clean it up. Ultimately, they closed the, their, their ability to, to mine in Spain. And I remember asking the president of the mining company, how did you end up in such a mess? And he said, well, we didn't know about tailings. He came from Sweden. We didn't know about tailings we know in, in, in Sweden, so we asked who's the best consultant and so on, and we, we retained him. So there wasn't any intent on the mining operator not to do the right thing. So the consultant who was advised uh, did what they thought was the right thing. But this is the stress strain behavior of the clay material that we found when we did the forensic investigation. Strain weakening the extreme, which was not identified at all in the original investigation. So there were fundamental errors in how to conduct an investigation, fundamental, uh, fundamental missing elements in instrumentation that didn't even go deep enough in the foundation to find the kind of yielding that was actually uh, discovered by the modeling. And this was five strain weakening model modeling done 30 years ago. 
by Professor Joaquin Marti uh, at the University of Madrid. So these are not new calculations. This is stretched one's ability in those days. And we could never publish any of this because it was all encumbered in litigation. And the bits and pieces are coming out. Our, our colleagues at the University of Barcelona who are consultants for the government did publish the causes. So these are not new things, but, but the, the insight for what, what, ha, what actually predicated the failure uh, in terms of my own involvement as a consultant to the people doing the forensic investigation uh, is a little different from what you'll find in the literature. So the, uh, at, at, in the, in the, uh, the middle of the lecture, I went to some detail to indicate performance-based risk-informed safe design as a way forward with an appeal to ICMM as opposed to the damned community, which has many mixed, uh, mixed interests, to ICM to request their, 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 their members to engage in this better way of doing business. And this is at the conceptual stage uh, that was written down in the PBRISD proposal for ISM to consider and, and how that goes into feasibility and then ultimately another fl uh, flavor that goes into stage three construction operations and you have to be sensitive to the same issues for closure implementation. That's not spelled out in detail, but it's the kind of elements that constitutes the building blocks of a safe management system. Uh, the that was under a review by ICMM when Brumadino occurred. And as we forecast in the Mount Polly study, if these things occur again, the industry will lose its license to, uh, to practice, which it did. And we won't go into uh, that in any detail. But ultimately, coming to the end, performance-based design is uh, becoming rapidly accepted. Certainly, all of the clients that I work with, if they have complicated ground conditions to manage, are recognizing that. The leading consultants, uh, most of them I work with, are adopting it. Instead of my indicating what it is, I've quoted a paper here by friends of ours in a leading group with ACOM, indicating the components of performance-based design, if you wish to uh, know what does it include in detail, from calculations to monitoring to revision and so on, the sort of Bayesian updating that proceeds in the process. And if you want to uh, uh, see their conclusion as opposed to mine, the power of this method is that through model calibration and validation during construction, we increase confidence and reduce uncertainty in the design. This is a long way from being just a, a maidservant in doing uh, iteration analyses. This is being a participant in what the design is supposed to do and how it's supposed to perform. So in conclusion, my journey from certainty to uncertainty in 63 years ends up with a positive outcome through the advocacy of performance-based design, building on advancements in computing power, software and instrumentation to allow real-time response monitoring and modeling in this way. Numerical modeling, in this way, numerical modeling has an integral role in enhancing our prediction abilities and improving the safe design, construction, and operations of geotechnically sensitive facilities. And you're all here because you share that interest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morgenstern, for this beautiful lecture. May I ask uh, Dr. Everett Hook to, to present the award? This is uh, our award of the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, trying to read it. I'll give you my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'll borrow the next time. Anyway, uh, that is your award you so and much. my sincere congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs>
We have a chance to ask a few questions. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We have a microphone which will come to you, and then you can ask your question, and Professor Morgenstern will answer. So who is the first? Ahmed Mufti, uh, Rock Science, Geomechanics Specialist. I saw your presentation, wonderful presentation, and uh, I heard of you when I was a kid in geotechnical engineering. I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what about other fields except this is slope stability and tailings? About what do you think about piling, for example? What do you think of shoring? Um, do you have any insights for those cases? Uh, is, it is it a general idea that you have for all types of for all fields of geotechnical engineering. Because, you know, what you have presented, it's like um, uh, case study oriented. And yes. it looks like it's all about dams and stability. Well, I mean, you, you would say that it can also be on tunnels. It, it, it depends on the uncertainty. For example, if we have a dam that we've done three times before, and we have experience with it, et cetera, et cetera. The uncertainty is limited to a little vanishing degree. And you could make the call that I'm not going to be benefiting by some complicated uh, representation of the deformation. So it's a degree of uncertainty. Uh, so I think the answer of where it might apply will depend. Settlement problems are, are, are some. Um, tunneling are others, but I think the world, it, it, the greatest uncertainty comes when we're dealing with the natural grounds. It has to do with the degree of complexity of foundations and how we're interacting. The mining industry is made more complicated because the, the performance, construction, productivity, whether it's a slope or whether it's a, a dam, is very much tied to the business case of the mine as opposed to building a water dam, which has its own business case and is more isolated. So I think you, to answer your question, where might these concepts be applied, uh, depends upon where the uncertainty resides. Do you uh, give the greatest part to the human error? The discovery, I think, that I've been trying to draw attention to in practice is the large amount of error that we as a community have been making. This is not new. Uh, Tertsagi began with the observational method but our abilities to manage these human errors have been minimal. And now we have better ways of doing it, clearly learning from the case histories, but making sure that we're monitoring all sorts of things as we get performance. We've had any number of cases where the ignorance about liquefaction created huge problems and so forth. I have one more question. Yes. Before I give the, the mic. Um, okay, so the last one. Last yes. one, last one. <laughs> Um, would you advise that we take some risk or not? Would I advise what? We take some risk in our designs or not? We always take some risk. It's a question of minimizing it. W would you? That was the last one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the last one. All right. We have a couple more questions. I, I, at least he said yes, right? He said <laughs> we can take risk, yeah. Well, in terms of failure, if you wanted to qualify it, you have to go to the owner, not us, not for we. For example, one owner that I do a lot of work with said, I cannot tolerate, the owner, not the consultant, cannot tolerate any fatalities and can't tolerate any movement of tailings off my lease boundary. That comes from the board of directors. So if you're a consultant or you're working for such a company, this is your mandate, this is your level of tolerability. It's not for you or me to decide what is the return period of that they corporately have declared it for very good business reasons, as an example. So risk-taking is, or if it's in the public domain, risk-taking is not necessarily something for the technical people to, to, to feel they own. So it's a complicated thing. What is a tolerable risk? Thank you very much. Dr. Rimokata? No, an absolutely excellent lecture. Um, one of the things that you coined a lovely expression, is embedded ignorance. Yes. And I was wondering if you could 
from your cases that you've looked at, whether you had at least a mental relationship between embedded ignorance and cost of sight investigation and understanding of how much you need to understand, if you yes. understand my question. <laughs> yes. The uh, cost of sight investigation has been a contributing factor. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the uh, Acadia Dam uh, had a very complicated foundation and was designed on remolding some weathered clay. And what could be weaker than the remolding weathered clay? You know, you've taken, you've made it as weak as it can. So the, the view that pervaded, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, a very well-known company, uh, daily, uh, excellent inspection, uh, the, the best, best qualifications you could get in Australia at the time. New South Wales has advanced risk analysis. Uh, the state of New South Wales has a dam safety committee and so on. All of the trappings. So can anything be worse than the remolded material? Well, if you have leaching and you get a very low, per, a, a very, uh, uh, low per, high porosity due to leaching, you might have a collapsible material. It would be worse. So they didn't map continually the foundation. Now, I've been involved, and some of you might be involved with a large mining company that mines in, in Dominican Republic, with a very complicated foundation as well. And they map every square meter of the foundation as it appears. And I remember some years ago, uh, the, the vice president of the mining company said, why do I have to spend all that money mapping that foundation? Everybody knows what it is. And I said, it keeps you out of jail. So, <laughs> so there are examples. And I think all of the companies that are understanding what we're talking about uh, realize that going out for low bids on site, uh, site characterization and so on, is a recipe for a problem. So cost is a factor. And uh, the, the, uh, I suppose the commercial pressurization that makes some of our colleagues obliged to do the work knowing that there are limitations is a contributing factor. There's no question. But I think that world, at least for the larger companies, has changed or is changing quickly. Plus the regulators, one of the big issues is getting the regulators to raise their sights as well. Factor of safety is not the answer in its traditional manner. Excellent, thank you very much. We have a question from Professor Dugawa. Am I on? Yes. Apparently, there I am. Hello, Nordy, to Dougal uh, McCrath. Yes, uh, Dougal, how are you? <laughs> uh, I'd like to go back to one of your early quotations that was wonderful, which is that the things we most need to know may be unknowable. Yeah. To what degree does this approach that you're now talking about get rid of that risk? Because you don't need to know, on a prima facie basis, everything. Well, I think when, when I discovered that sort of uh, pithy summary of my dilemma, I think it's been reduced that we can minimize the unknowability, which we all do by observations, but the, the, the casting of the observations in a predictive format, and with the equivalent of Bayesian updating, which is embedded in the performance-based design, minimizes the unknowability. And if you still have something, well, it's hard to know what you don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but you're, you're so sort of more anticipative that everything is performing as intended. So, so I think, I think the uh, performance-based design reduces that prospect, but of course, we never know everything. Thank you for that question. <laughs> yes, Professor Peter Kaiser. Since the mic is close, I ask my question. In your journey from certainty to uncertainty, one major change in ability to monitor is that we can measure extensive surface movements, radar, etc. Yeah. Has that had a significant impact on pushing the uncertainty back to more certainty? Oh yes, sure, all of that monitoring uh, is integrated into the performance-based design. But as you know, surface thing doesn't tell you what's down below. I remember, and you may remember the case history of the Edmonton Convention Center. This was a deep excavation, and its time was the largest permanent supported uh, excavation with Tybex in the world, I think, in a clay shale. And I logged the core myself, and it had a zone of bentonite, and we did analyses as we excavated that the bentonite, which had a low strength, but would not fail to its residual. 
So we did the best finite elements we could do at that time. But we didn't have the ability to do elastic plastic, and we designed the basis that this material would not, would not shear. And once we began to excavate a little bit, we saw a slip surface develop at this interface down below. So when we lived through that, when we wake up in the morning, they're excavating, how much did it move yesterday? Oh, uh, Dr. Morgan said it moved three millimeters, thank you. <laughs> and, but fortunately it was deep, and uh, the factor of safety reduced significantly, but there was a case of best knowledge, logging the core, the best ability to analyze at that time, much less than we can today. One had embedded ignorance about a mechanism. So these are stories from my own path to maturity. <laughs> And I think if, we're, if we all shared our, our experiences, there would be others like it. One didn't know enough about the time, at the time. You can only do that once, though. <laughs> okay, we have time for maybe two more questions, but we have Dr. Manush with a question, and then if anybody else wants to ask a question, we have one more chance. A oh, wonderful presentation indeed, and uh, geotechnical engineering is such a fun to work in because of the challenges due to uncertainties, for sure. Uh, you mentioned about tunnels in response to a question. Uh, I'm from Rock Science, my name is Manoj Verman, and I come from India, which is where we have the Himalayas, considered by far the most difficult tunneling medium in the world, apart from perhaps Alps in Europe and uh, Andes in South America, and to perhaps a slightly lesser extent, Rockies here in Canada, maybe Urals, et cetera. So my question is, in those difficult conditions where there's uncertainty galore, uh, in, in tunneling, for example, under high overburden, high stresses, water uncertainties, uh, you know, frequently changing geology, and all that stuff, and difficult access, so therefore the investigation, the monitoring, all is difficult. So there's a high degree of uncertainty. So do you have anything else to add to what you've already told us uh, for the performance-based design in those difficult conditions? Well, I think in those difficult conditions, performance-based design is essential. And performance-based design for your major hydro projects and tunnels and so on is not an expensive thing anymore. So I think it is a relief that you can gather that complexity into a well-formulated site model and approach it tied to the construction and so on. Once you've said, I've engineered it to an acceptable outcome, here's what I'm going, and here's what your cost may be plus or minus a little bit, but you're not gonna kill anybody and things like that. I think it's a solution to your complexity. Thank and of you. course, this company has made contributions for your ability to do that. Thank you very much. Sir Morgan said. Now, a special question has come in. I've been asked to ask you that question. What advice do you have for young engineers who are starting out in their careers? Based on what you've gone through, what advice do you have for young to, engineers? To the young engineers? Or the yes, to the young engineers. They want to know. Well, what would you advise? I would say beware of the new embedded ignorance because you're all learning to compute. You're all learning to instrument, but none of you are learning much engineering geology anymore. And if you look through my list of problems, they probably are centered along where the geology has been underestimated. And we're not talking about the big regional picture of the Himalayas, we're talking about local complexity of weathering and shearing and, and, and so on and so forth. And I expect my good friend and colleague will speak a little bit about this tomorrow. But that, I think in terms of current education, uh, where I have, still have an interest, our ability to transmit that degree of understanding, whether it's you know, geomorphological complexity or stratigraphic, in a, in a compact and adequate way, is the new weakness in our, in our system. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, help me appreciate Professor Morgan one more time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.